if you all want to go ahead and get settled in, we will go ahead and get started now. We're running just a little bit behind. As you all know, we generally start right on time. So thank you so much for your patience. My name is Adrian Lawrence, and I'm a vice president at Jennifer Brown Consulting, where we work in ensuring that people in their workplaces feel welcomed, valued, respected, and heard. And I want to thank you for joining us for this July 2022 Advocacy and Action Conversation, Realizing an Untapped Resource, Making Your Workplace Welcoming for Autistic Women. And we are so excited that you're joining us here today. Day. This conversation is being recorded. Also, you'll have an opportunity to share your thoughts as well as questions uh, that hopefully we can answer to the best of our ability. And that'll be toward the last uh, or toward the later part of our conversation today. And in the interim, what I would definitely love to do is to welcome in our partner. Our conversation today is in partnership with the Autism Women and Non-Binary Network. And from the network, we have Dr. Morena Kay, who is the Equity, Justice, and Representation uh, Representative from AWN. Morena Kay, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, everyone, I'm really grateful that you're here with us to commemorate the um, um, Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, I am Marina K. Gewell Nairu, and I am, um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and they, them, theirs. And I am a proud member um, of the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, or AWN, as we call ourselves for short. And, and just very quickly um, to, to share who we are. We are a nonprofit organization um, who's focused on um, representative justice, equity, um, inclusion. We want to have a supportive environment in um, a cross disability, but we are focused particularly on disability justice. We were founded um, a little over 10 years ago, actually in the basement of um, a single parent of um, autistic children who had just uh, received their own autism diagnosis. It found that there were so few things for those of us who are non-binary or trans or who are assigned women at birth or women. There were a lot of uh, resources and, and activities that um, information if you were a little boy or if perhaps you were you know a, a assigned male at birth and you know fit certain stereotypes but there were, were not a lot of things for other people and so after searching in vain for resources um, one was started and so awn has started from um, a very tiny labor of love to a global nonprofit organization that um, works in a number of different ways to meet community needs in terms of publications, voice and representation, intersectional education, advocacy, material support, and so many things. And I'll share for the end some ways that you can be involved with AWN, but I just, we're really um, grateful to be able to partner with um, Jennifer Brown Consulting for this event. Thank you so much. We appreciate that insight in your organization. And we'll have an opportunity, as Marina K mentioned, to talk more about it and how you can get involved later in our conversation today. And also as a note, for those of you who have never participated or uh, had the good fortune to be a part of our conversations, our Advocacy in Action monthly series, there will be a link in the chat that you can click to, to provide your questions. And those are something that hopefully Marina K and I will be able to address uh, in our conversation after this brief presentation where we discuss how to create more inclusive workplaces for women with autism. So first off, let's talk about why we're here. It's Disability Pride Month. It's so incredibly important that we acknowledge people and the different walks that they come from, that intersection of life. And as we just came off of celebrating Pride Month, we do want to acknowledge that there are people, again, from different walks of life and different journeys that are uh, intersectional. And so we need to acknowledge that. And fortunately, we have organizations out there like AWN who do a wonderful job at uplifting voices, but we all need to be very much invested in those conversations, including in the workplace. Also, it's important to talk about women with autism because we are often ignored, very much so. Uh, it's often the thought, which we'll talk about the stereotypes there, that it is a white male uh, affliction, that it is something that does not impact women, and that is something that is very problematic because individuals sh should be seen. And this is good because it also means seeing people means you can provide them with the resources available so that they can be uh, optimal in terms of their life, their livelihood, and the contributions they have for our society. Also, we need to bear in mind that neurodiversity 
that whole realization that how people's minds work, how their brains work and the differences between them, it's beautiful. It's part of inclusivity. And we want to be able to ensure that we're including this in our DEI conversations. Also, the reality is organizations are missing out. The fact is that people who have minds that function differently, such as myself, we bring a lot to the table. Uh, and that's also something we'll talk about as we often, uh, when we look back in history, we note people like Einstein, uh, Nikola Tesla, and so on and so forth. So many individuals have been on the autism spectrum because they thought differently. We have a lot of the inventions, the uh, accesses, the things that have advanced our society today. And we want to bear that in mind because we want uh, as business leaders and as business people to provide the best resources, the best products, the best services we can. And we can't do that if our minds are not expanded or we're not uh, tapping into the human capital and the resources we have available that think differently. We also all have to do more to achieve our DEI goals. Once again, neurodiversity is an incredible part of DEI. It is that beautiful part of diversity that is among us and that we all carry. And so we want to make sure that we continue to uplift it. So for understanding autism, uh, it is something that is extremely misunderstood. And as someone who was late diagnosed myself, I can tell you that there is a lot of, unfortunately, I'd say ignorance out there and it holds people back significantly. And I will go ahead and lump some of that on, uh, on the part of the medical community because they have lumped so many of us together by virtue of just not knowing a lot of things. But the reality is that we'll talk about is it is a spectrum and there is so much diversity within it. So when we look at and have conversations about what is autism, first, we have to bear in mind, it is, as I will say, simply a difference in communication and processing. It means that how I interact with the world is different. How I process information is different, just as how you may interact with the world is different, how you communicate and process. And the thing is, is it's how my brain is mapped, how brains operate. This is simply a different neurotype. It is a neurotype, it is a difference. It is not an insult. And as we'll mention, it is not necessarily, as far as I'm concerned, a disability. It can be a difference and it also can be a disability, but we wanna let people define themselves for themselves. We also wanna bear in mind that this is a spectrum of behaviors and abilities. Again, differences in how we interact with the world, differences in our abilities, the things we can do and how we can make contributions. And it is incredibly important that we bear that in mind because once again, if we have a homogeneous population and workforce, then we are gonna get the same product. We're gonna get the same results. But if we want to go higher, if we want to advance, we want to bear in mind that we should have people who think differently, who see the world differently, who communicate and process differently. But we have to also create environments that are inclusive and welcoming and get past our own biases so that we can welcome in individuals who are different and different in how they think and how their mind operates. Also, we want to bear in mind that autism is ever evolving. And when I say that, I say the science, the medicine. The fact is that um, a lot of science out there, they still don't necessarily know, and particularly when we speak about women. Uh, because again, this is something that was uh, originally kind of thought to be a white boy's disease, uh, not bearing in mind that individuals are socialized different based on their genders, and that can impact how you interact with this world. And also we want to bear in mind that everything is always evolving. Things are ever changing in workplaces and in society, which is why we want to continue to learn when it comes to DEI, to continue to embrace individuals of different walks of life who may not be like us, but who can contribute to bringing us all up as, as an organization together. So first let's go ahead and talk about some of the common misconceptions when we talk about autism. So oftentimes people will automatically assume it's a learning disability. That is not the case. As we talked about, it's a different neurotype. And while there can be certain things that are associated with someone's autism, whether it's a comorbidity, another um, maybe a different mental health issue or a health issue that may come along with that in some 
form or some fashion or with an individual themselves, we want to bear in mind that autism alone is not a learning disability. It's also exclusively, it's not exclusively white male. It impacts people across the board. And even though diagnosis rates for women uh, and people of color are particularly low, that is likely more of a reflection of our society and the biases we hold and also the access certain people have to uh, care. And so we want to make sure that, again, we let people define themselves for themselves and we keep an open mind. We also want to bear in mind that it is not a childhood affliction exclusively. Uh, it's not something that leaves you as an adult. There are millions of people in our society who are adults who have been diagnosed with autism. It's not something that you grow out of. Rather, it's, again, a neurotype, how your brain operates. It's also not simply being socially awkward. Uh, I can't begin to tell you how people say, oh, well, we're all a little autistic. Um, those things are microaggressions. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's something that a lot of people don't seem to understand. And also when individuals aren't necessarily socially awkward on the surface, people often will say, oh, you can't be autistic. You don't have a certain look. You don't present yourself in a particular way. Again, we want to avoid having these biases, these stereotypes, these microaggressions, because we want to let people define themselves for themselves. We also want to acknowledge and recognize. We want to see people for who they are. Also, it's not a matter of lacking empathy. Uh, that's often one of those stereotypes out there, simply because people don't convey empathy in a way that uh, maybe what they call neurotypical, which would uh, be people who don't have a certain neurotype. Um, uh, it's the, the negative way of saying neurotypical would say the norm, uh, but the thought is that, oh, you lack empathy if you're autistic. That is not true at all. That is a common misconception. Uh, if you happen to show empathy differently, then oftentimes people will think you lack it. And again, we have to let people define themselves for themselves and we want to overcome our own biases. We also don't wanna assume that someone must be a savant or a genius uh, simply because they're autistic. There are individuals who do have savant-like qualities and skills uh, without a doubt. There are people across the board no matter what. And while that is a very beautiful thing and something that should be cherished, it should not be imposed upon people simply because they are autistic. Uh, we don't want to create uh, standards based on stereotypes. Uh, again, letting people define themselves for themselves. Uh, more common misconceptions that is vaccine inducing. That is not something that I am looking to argue or debate. Uh, also, when it comes to uniform, uh, this thought that all autistic people must do, be able to do this. They all must look like this or interact with the world in a certain way. Again, these are common misconceptions and they are very limiting. Uh, just as we wouldn't say, oh, Adrian, you're black, you must sing and dance very well. Those things are microaggressions. Again, it's the assumption that everyone must be the same if this is a box that you check. We do not want to get into that kind of interaction or behaviors with people. We want to let people define themselves for themselves because as we remember, it's a spectrum of behaviors. This is a different neurotype different processing and communication. It doesn't necessarily mean that all people who are autistic do X, Y, and Z. We also don't want to assume it is a disability as in it's limiting someone in some way. Again, letting people define themselves for themselves, where they are and what they can accomplish and what they can do. Uh, again, I consider um, being on the autism spectrum, I consider myself to be different. I do not necessarily consider myself to be disabled in any form or fashion. Um, and that is a conversation we can dive into more later when we discuss some of uh, the limitations that are often imposed upon people. So when we talk about common traits, and these are things to bear in mind when we are talking about workplaces. So when it comes to common traits that people with autism may often manifest, um, these are things like communication efficiency. Uh, for example, uh, people on the autism spectrum tend to be direct. Uh, that uh, directness can often be assumed to be rudeness or bluntness, but it's about being efficient in how I process my words and how I interact. And that can also be reflective of the fact that um, I may not engage in what I may say would be um, fluffy language or things that are very vague and that are not necessarily, um, not necessarily, I would say productive. Um, I often in my trainings will use the term synergy to explain to people that I will not be using terms like that. I am very direct in what I'm saying so that you can understand 
the message that I'm sending through. That is efficiency. And people on the autism spectrum tend to be very efficient with their language because it reduces demands on executive functioning. Uh, you know, trying to talk in this fluffy language, uh, it, it can create significant misinterpretation, misinterpretations. Um, so being direct, getting to the point, um, it's something that tends to be very common. Also, there can be a struggle in reading cues in part because uh, there's essentially a way in which brains function that they engage, uh, neurotypical brains engage in a sense of mind reading uh, in another way. Uh, and also there are some social norms that are unspoken or unsaid and a number of them can be extremely um, unproductive. And so it doesn't necessarily make sense, but it's something that we often do. So reading those social cues can be very difficult for people on the spectrum. Uh, for example, something I've run into is when, uh, let's say I've invited a coworker to an event and that coworker responds, I'll get back to you. That meant no, but how am I supposed to know that? Because I took what they said directly. I did not understand that that was a social cue that they were um, putting in my direction as a no when the word no would have been a lot easier. Uh, so some of these cues can be extremely limiting, uh, but again, they are, uh, as far as I'm concerned, very unproductive, uh, but they are something that uh, many people in society do engage in and thus uh, people on the autism spectrum, we can struggle with them. Also, uh, people on the autism spectrum tend to have more of a novel thought. Because again, if you are thinking outside the box, you see things differently. Uh, maybe you see things as more efficient uh, because they may not uh, necessarily align with the status quo, but you know they could be more productive. Um, it's, it's a way in which you interpret the world because again, it's a difference in communication and processing. So I like to regard it as a novel thought and a difference and how you can achieve certain things. Also, as my example mentioned earlier, the literal perception. Uh, yes, I believe it's the gestalt cognitive style is something that individuals on the autism spectrum often reflect, but it basically leads to a literal perception and processing of information. Uh, this is again, high efficiency. Um, so that means it'll take longer to work out words um, such as synergy or when people say we're going to um, stand up a presentation or a talk, I do not know what these things mean. So I will often ask questions of what are you getting at? What do you mean? Uh, and we'll see these things and they go from culture to culture. Uh, the East Coast culture is very different than the West Coast culture and colloquialisms and phrasings, um, they can be very unique as though essentially people are speaking different languages. And as a result of that, it can be especially limiting when we're having conversations because again, um, you simply want people to say what they want and say what they mean directly. And that isn't necessarily how our society operates. Also, individuals on the autism spectrum often engage in what they call information chunking. Um, I, I believe the word is uh, echolalia. Uh, excuse me if I mispronounce that. I generally tend to take things very literally, so it's very difficult when words don't necessarily match um, their spelling. But it's a way of banking information and chunking information, and it can be used in a way that increases the flexibility of it, but it's taken in in mass times. And so you'll see um, various traits and commonalities such as hyper-focusing, being able to absorb considerable amounts of information and using that information and storing phrases in a way that it doesn't put as much stress on cognitive processing. Again, this leads to higher efficiency in communication and it definitely can lead to greater efficiency in work product. Also, uh, individuals on the spectrum uh, will engage in information dumping. It's a very authentic autistic trait and conversation style. It's about verbally downloading information in great detail uh, as it's taken in. And it's a way oftentimes that autistic people will use it to uh, form and build connections and to share. I find myself doing it at times, which is probably why I do trainings. Uh, I enjoy sharing considerable information. Uh, and so getting into that dumping is something that um, I find to be somewhat exhilarating. But when we talk about women on the spectrum in particular, let's go ahead and focus on in as again, uh, this is often thought to be a male uh, kind of difference in brain type and that is not necessarily the truth in any way. So when we're talking about women on the spectrum, we know that about 2 million adults in the United States are diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum and about 500,000 of them are adult women. Uh, again, when you have a any kind of difference that has generally been built up in a um, and seen through the lens of 
the male perspective or the white perspective, then you're going to have individuals who do not meet those characteristics who are essentially outliers. They're left out in the cold, which is why a lot of women who are adults who are being diagnosed are finding themselves later in life being diagnosed. And it can be a very eye-opening experience and knowledge to realize that's what's been going on this whole time. That is why I have been struggling in certain arenas. And the thing is, is it is significant and it is changing lives and it creates opportunities. And like the AWN network can give women an opportunity to come together. Also, uh, the diagnosis rates, we're looking at one to three when it comes to women to men being diagnosed still, because we know that a lot of the diagnostic standards and things have been crafted around boys, uh, around men. For example, some of the tests and the questions will ask, do you like playing with trains, maps, things that generally boys are socialized to play, play with, but women, girls, not necessarily the case. So it'll lead to a lot of gaps when it comes to uh, individuals and groups and communities and also research and being able to learn more. But the reality is that when it comes to women with autism, the characteristics are different than men because we are socialized different. How the world forces us to interact so that we can advance, so that we can be a part of the communities around us, shapes us in different ways. And it causes us to, again, interact with the world differently and to present differently. So when we have conversations about how autism will often manifest in women, we have to bear in mind that you're gonna have different interests. This is often true, um, but in part because oftentimes women on the spectrum will find themselves in solitude more. And maybe that's because we can miss social, social cues, because we're less likely to fall in with a popular crowd to go along uh, with the majority. And so that can create some isolation, maybe fewer friends. We're going to have our own interests that are very different than what a lot of women may find themselves to be interested in. Uh, there's the thought that oftentimes we might be adverse to some extent to what is popular, in part uh, because we tend to be practical. We tend to be functional because that's what makes sense. High efficiency. Let's do what makes sense, what advances us. So there may be certain behaviors, certain interests that don't necessarily um, align with women on the autism spectrum as often as they do neurotypical women, uh, in part because it's not practical. It does not make sense, uh, as opposed to let's focus on what is practical and what serves the purpose that it needs to serve. We also often find that women on the spectrum will suffer from considerable anxiety and exhaustion. Because the reality is when you live in a world that isn't meant for you, it can create a lot of social anxiety. And you get tired often doing what they call camouflaging, um, finding ways to act quote unquote normal, to fit in, to engage in behaviors or conversations similar to others around you who may not necessarily treat you as welcoming if you're a little bit different or may not necessarily create space for you. And so that can be a considerable weight. Also, we can often find ourselves on the periphery of social activity, um, in part, again, for those same reasons, but also because we may have interests that don't necessarily align with the vast majority of neurotypical women. Uh, women on the spectrum also can appear to be naive or immature. Uh, and I would like to think in part that that comes from also being highly logical, being functional, being practical, and not necessarily being able to engage in mind reading or uh, understanding things from a more neurotypical uh, perspective. And this is something that I have run into um, and oftentimes the case because I would not understand why someone would seek to engage in that behavior toward me because it doesn't make any sense. It is illogical. Why would you act in a petty way towards someone who, uh, for example, is your superior, as that would put you in a position of um, possibly losing your job? So I wouldn't necessarily see things coming, but because uh, human nature can engage in all sorts of behavior and neurotypical people can look to soothe insecurities they have by acting out in various ways, people will engage in behavior. Yet women on the spectrum, we might be the last ones to necessarily see it because it doesn't make sense. Also, being able to conceal part of your personality at different times. And I don't mean just kind of the home personality you may have for the workplace personality, but literally 
taking these aspects of yourself and showcasing different sides of your personality, depending on the environment, because you are camouflaging, because you are hiding these aspects of who you are and your identity that are maybe aspects of your personality or key to um, the uh, being autistic and how your brain works and develops, but essentially you have learned to adapt in these environments. And again, these things contribute to considerable exhaustion and anxiety. And so let's talk about how this kind of stuff can manifest in workplaces. So first off, uh, running into stereotypes. Women on the spectrum often hearing that, no, you can't have autism. It's something that's exclusive to men. Or this thought that, no, you know, you're a person of color. I, I, they can't see you in that regard. So I have run into this thought that, oh, she's uh, blunt and direct and she's not adhering to gender norms. Oh, because she's a black woman. Oh, you know that they're, they're bold and sassy as opposed to this very much, uh, this being direct and also giving you all of the accurate information. Um, this is very much a part of how my brain operates. Uh, I grew up in a pretty well-to-do white community. Uh, so uh, this um, stereotype you have of black women may not necessarily be accurate in any form or fashion. And so when you don't allow me to define myself for myself or embrace my differences and you you identify me with certain stereotypes, then it can become extremely limiting. Also a stereotype, the thought that, oh, you, you must be emotionally unregulated. You must have meltdowns, so to speak. Um, that again is a very limiting stereotype, especially when we see um, just about every day, neurotypical people have uh, very, very significant meltdowns in workplaces, as far as I'm concerned, I'll call them meltdowns, but with uh, yelling and being overly aggressive and angry, um, these things often happen. And the thought that you can't control your emotions and that there must be something wrong with you and we can't take the risk, those things are very uh, ableist and they're very limiting. And the company will often lose out the organization. Also with the push for cultural fit, there's an idea oftentimes in many organizations that you have to meet the cultural expectations. That means you need to walk like me, talk like me, come from the school I went to, from my background, same class, all of these things that can be especially limiting. And we want to move away from those. We have to move away from those because there are people with, again, different neurotypes, different backgrounds, different expectations and interactions. And we need to make way for that. Also women on the spectrum often will run into unspoken rules that they're expected to know. Again, I'm expected to know that I'll get back to you means no. When, hey, there are actually different places, different people where I'll get back to you actually means I'll get back to you. And so to have to know what these unspoken rules are to do this extra level of mind reading can be very limiting as well. And then upholding the status quo. That can show up when it comes to gender norming very often. Uh, the status quo may generally mean maybe women don't challenge men in the workplace or point out things that could be better or be improved. And when you see the world differently and you see things that can be improved and you know how it can be done, it can be very difficult not to share that knowledge and information, especially when you have been hired and you've been brought on to provide the insight that you have, the human capital. And so when the status quo of an organization is really one of almost, um, shall we say, maintaining people's sense of, um, let's see, I guess, egotistical comfort, it can become very difficult for an individual who doesn't see the need for fluffy language, but is very direct in their communication and has the knowledge to bring you to the next level, to lift you up but for the status quo seeking to impose its limitations. It can be very, very challenging for people in the workplace, particularly women on the spectrum. Also, there are a number of assumptions. The thought again, that you're disabled, where as far as I'm concerned, I consider it a difference. Uh, I, and also this thought, which is very ableistic, is the thought that, oh, you must be incompetent. You must have a shortcoming in some way that we must provide an accommodation for you, or I have to help you out in this form or fashion. Again, we need to let people define themselves for themselves. Also, this is a thought that, oh, you, you're not autistic at all. You're, you don't have autism. You must be seeking attention. Again, that can be especially limiting. And everyone wants to be seen. They want to be embraced for who they are. 
So we have to allow that by not trying to place our own limited knowledge and experience on people because people manifest things in very different ways. And simply because it's not a way in which maybe you yourself know uh, or have seen does not mean that it does not exist. Also, we want Again, it goes with understanding uh, the cultural fit kind of mentality, understanding vague terminology like synergy. Uh, there are these terms out there that uh, entities, individuals will often use and not everybody understands or gets them, but there's often an assumption that everybody knows what, we're what I'm talking about. And so we'll talk about ways in which you can break down those assumptions so you can communicate more efficiently as you want to bear in mind that not everyone necessarily will completely understand what you are saying. And thus it can be very limiting in workplaces. Also, we wanna be mindful of stressors, whether it is uh, intense sen sensory situations, for example, if you have um, lights, uh, whether it's a harsh type of inside light versus natural light, also uh, a loud work environment, if you have intense smells going on, uh, lacking privacy opportunity, having crowded spaces, these things all are very limiting and especially distracting. And when you have a difference in communication and processing, it can be something that can hamper your ability to provide optimal performance. So we're also going to talk about ways in which you can create a workplace, you can shape it so that it is more welcoming for people so that they can do their best work and contribute their knowledge. Also having an unnecessary dress code. We often see that as the case because it's part of the status quo. Uh, you know, there are things that of course are required for safety purposes, but uh, making people dress in ways that uh, makes them extremely uncomfortable, uh, especially when you have sensory issues, when it doesn't feel good to have something that constricting on your body. We want to be mindful of these things because they can often interfere with someone's ability to provide optimal performance, as well as their desire to be there at all. Some people may simply just not want to do, deal with it because if you can't focus on your work because you're focusing on your attire, it can be, again, especially limiting, and it's the organization that loses out. So let's talk about how we can shape inclusivity. So first off, that interview process. We want to focus on the KSAs, knowledge, skills, abilities. These are things that are key because oftentimes if you uh, stim, which might mean moving side to side or moving your foot or you're moving in some way uh, that you're self-soothing or coping yourself through a conversation, it could be interpreted by a neurotypical person or non-holistic person as being as being something of uh, indicative of maybe the person not being honest, sincere, or there being something wrong behaviorally when it's not the case at all. It's simply how my body responds. So in the interview process, focusing on what are their knowledge, skills, and abilities, not so much on what is their behavior like? Are they making eye contact with me? Are they giving over eye contact with me? We also wanna go virtual where we can. You can avoid things like proximity issues or people feeling uncomfortable or making judgments uh, on maybe the way someone dresses or their movements. So if you do have the option to go virtual, it'll create more opportunities. But of course, we want to bear in mind that not everybody necessarily operates very well virtually or has access um, to high-speed internet or whatnot. So even if it's a matter of picking up a phone, it can go the distance in terms of bringing in candidates who aren't exactly like the people we already have brought through the door. We also wanna welcome various experiences. Maybe that's uh, not a matter of saying, oh, well, did you go to this school or do you have this certification? Because if it's a hobby the person has engaged in and they know everything about it much more, far more than anyone who has uh, acronyms behind their name, pay attention to that. Because there are people who will hyper-focus, they will dive into a topic and they have it mastered but maybe they don't have a master's. You don't wanna miss out on quality talent. So find ways in which you can enjoy that person, enjoy the qualities, the skills, the experiences that they have, benefit from it, give them an opportunity to contribute. And that may be recognizing that not everybody is going to get the same knowledge from the same sources. Also, check your own biases. Recognize that it's not necessarily uh, indicative of something uh, adverse or negative simply because the individual 
is moving more than usual. Or maybe again, giving way too much eye contact by your standards or giving uh, not enough. We wanna be mindful that people are different and embrace that difference. Our focus here is can the person do the job? Will they contribute? Because we want to create ways in which we can create inclusive cultures. Also looking at our interaction, how are we interacting with people? You want to allow the people you work with to share without penalty. Again, we don't want to uphold the status quo, preserve ego to the point of losing out on productivity, on advancement, on innovation. And when you have people you are working with who may be different, maybe they have a different neurotype and they have the knowledge and information to take you to the next level. Do you think that that person will stay with your organization very long if you will not hear them? People want to feel welcomed, valued, respected, and heard. And we do not want egos to get in the way and to limit people's contributions, especially when we, our organization, could be the one to become the industry leader instead of having that individual who wasn't heard go somewhere else or maybe even start their own company. We also want to welcome questions because, again, there are things that are often said that I don't understand because people are using colloquialisms or their own little lingo. No, just tell me what you want. And I've said that many times to my clients and I explain to them why, and they appreciate it so much because I, I don't have time. Uh, and it's not in anyone's good uh, usage of time for people to dance around what they need as opposed to just directly tell me. Uh, we do live in a society where it's the thought we need to be nice. We have to preserve this sense of decorum. And the thing is that can hamper productivity. It can hamper efficiency. And because I need that directness, I need people to welcome that and to embrace that and to move in their space. And that might be a little bit difficult and challenging at times, but the thing is, it's about working together. Also in workplaces to be transparent about expectations. Again, what do you want from me? What do you need? Because I can't read between the lines. I cannot read your mind. Um, I, I, I don't understand. If you're saying, I'll get back to you and you really mean no, I need direct interaction. Also, little things like scheduling a meeting in advance, letting people know what's on the agenda, because it can be extremely stressful when uh, a woman or an individual on the spectrum is unprepared, or they do not know what is going on, and all of a sudden, it's a very sudden change. Uh, this is not, again, these are not necessarily things that will impact everyone, again, because it is a spectrum and people are different, but it can be extraordinarily stressful, especially if that person is in a hyper-focus mode. Uh, for example, when I used to practice law, um, I, I, I did very well because there were rules and I, you know, I didn't have to uh, walk into situations where someone would maybe take advantage of my naivete or anything of that measure because there were rules that governed how I'd interact with others. Uh, also, information dumping was great because I'd learn a lot. Being direct when you're billing at $450 uh, an hour and the partner you're working with is billing at over $1,000 an hour, being direct, blunt, and to the point, it is priceless and getting the job done. That is also priceless. But also if I were hyper-focused on a case and what I was working on in my office and someone were to do a pop-up meeting, oh no, that would not work for me. I could not do that. I cannot switch as quickly as others may be able to. And that is something that I would need uh, a little bit of patience for. So scheduling that meeting, even if it was a half an hour in advance, that is something that can help in terms of creating more welcoming and inclusive environments. Also education. We have to educate ourselves. We already know uh, a number of individuals on the spectrum know there are so many stereotypes. There are stereotypes, myths, uh, just blatant lies out there about autism, about the spectrum. Also there are significant changes. Uh, for example, some people will still use the term Asperger's. Uh, I believe that's what Elon Musk use, uses. And that has been changed here in the US where it's been moved onto the autism spectrum uh, for various reasons. And so there are differences in language uses, usages, how uh, people wanna interact, how people wanna be addressed. And the thing is, again, you let people define themselves for themselves. Sometimes people do not like being called autistic. They prefer to be known as an individual with autism. Again, these things are important to bear in mind. And we do not wanna to come to the table and assume we know, or also assume that, hey, I know how you're gonna act, or I know how you're gonna handle something. 
Because again, we need to let people define themselves for themselves. So continued training is especially important, especially because we live in a society that will often reinforce stereotypes. It'll reinforce notions, things that it believes we must believe. And so we want to be mindful of that. And that's something that we can only do when we continue to learn, share our knowledge as our society continues to progress. All right, so I have done enough talking in this moment and I am going to welcome back in Dr. Morena Kay. Uh, if she can join me, that would be fantastic. So we can have our conversation um, in our Q&A portion. Yes, and just wow, the chat, everyone was, I don't know, I don't know, I, with my eyes going back and forth between what Adrian was saying and I'm like, wow, you know, just, this isn't my life. You're, you're just calling in, sharing so much important information and then um, the remarks that were being made in the chat. I, I just really appreciate everyone for um, communicating so candidly um, with, you know, and just engaging with the material. And um, I know that um, um, Sophia has, um, shared the information for you all to ask questions. And so we can have some Q and A um, and I'd also like, again, if we when we have some time to talk a little bit more about what AWN does and how to, um, you know, and, and, and I guess maybe, um, Sophia, Sophia, are there um, questions yet? If there aren't, I could talk a little bit first. There are. And so I will go ahead and start okay. pitching the questions. She is texting it to me. Um, and so I have them all available. And also I wanna remind anybody out there, there is a link in the chat if you would like to go ahead and submit a question. So the first question we have, is what special considerations should be made to support non-binary people with autism differently than the support provided to women with autism? I am so, so glad that was the first question um, because gender diversity is so common in um, the autistic community, depending upon what research that you look at in terms of people identifying as something other than what they were um, assigned at birth and or considering themselves LGBTQ can be approximately 50% according to some um, recent studies. And um, often one thing that we find is that while it's important to, um, so anyone who's on the spectrum, regardless of one's gender, you know, we know that you know, there are certain things about us that are different as has been shared in this presentation. Um, so if a person identifies as male, it doesn't mean that their life is sunshine and, and unicorns, but it does mean that there is more information, more resources, they're more likely to be diagnosed. And so if a person, people had started to get information about women um, and less so, but we, we wanna, what we want, the first thing you want to do is not treat individuals who are non-binary like women like. A person who is non-binary is non-binary. Um, and that is a spectrum as well. For example, I consider myself a non-binary woman. I, I do identify as a woman. Um, for various reasons, but I, I do, but I am non-binary. It isn't, it's, it's, it's not, it's a complicated thing. And so one thing I think that's very important is to, to not make assumptions. Of, um, a lot of the terminology that people use erases people's lives. So, you know, when you can say something like, you know, student, you know, or so instead of ladies and gentlemen, you know, you know, clients, people, my community, you know, or, you know, instead of brothers and sisters, brothers, sisters, siblings, or siblings, family, um, instead of, you know, can you automatically, you know, instead of othering someone, just make assumptions that a person could be of any and gender, and regardless of what you're seeing in front of you, um, you allow them, to, if they have, if they have not identified, because some people are not comfortable or safe identifying just to random strangers, um, nibbling is another one that can be used, um, uncle, you know, some people use so I just encourage people to use terminology that can fit for anyone and to work for anyone um, and to make sure to address and bring up matters of gender because oftentimes they're not addressed. And so it is the person who themselves, the onus is on that individual to have to bring those things up. Um, a lot of, in the workplace, there's a lot of gendered labor that occurs, um, even if it's unintentional in terms of tasks that people are given, in terms of the way that people are um, sometimes um, groups or teams together, um, even with, you know, if there's like, you know, conferences or trips and, and room sharing. So I think that really is very important to, um, to try to apply a, a, a principle of universal design um, so that it could be uh, something that would be, that would work for everyone. Um, and that way, you're like, your policy book, your handbook, do you have he, she everywhere and, and not they? 
do you have um, a place where someone can select their gender or they have to misgender themselves every time they fill out the forms in HR? There's so many different things, but the, the most important thing is that you're thinking about it at all. And I think that, that puts you ahead of the curve and will allow you to start um, creating the space and then hopefully making you know room and making com um, people comfortable to share additional things that they need. All right, thank you so much for sharing that. Our next question is, um, and I will also note that we do these monthly conversations, trainings, uh, advocacy in action, and we uh, often do tackle things, um, especially particular to the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, and so I believe you should definitely keep an eye out as I believe we are going to be addressing things uh, specific to uh, more workplaces and creating inclusivity when it comes to things like uh, pronouns, usage, and so on and so forth. Uh, also our second question, my question is about white identifying women who are neurodivergent, who are autistic, um, who may, due to a different way of processing, state that they don't see race or engage in subtle acts of exclusion. What do you do when standard accountability tools don't work? Oh. <laughs> I'm going to be 100% honest with you. I don't think we have enough time to address that this question fairly, <laughs> but I'm going to just give a, 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 a quick answer. And that is, um, I think that what they fail to understand is their levels you know, like, so intersectionality, you know, it, it, it differs, you know, and, and humans, myself, I've got marginalizations, I've got privileges as well, tons of them. And so I think that what people need to understand is there's not a zero sum game. And so no, their perspective of, of race may differ, may not be the same as someone who is non-autistic or who is, um, you know, who is autistic or who is, um, you know, neurotypical, it might be different. But to say that you don't see it is just a lie. Yes, because that's I, I, not possible. I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, the unfortunate part of this question is that it assumes or it allows an individual to say, oh, I'm racist or I engage in racist behavior because I'm autistic. That is completely and totally, um, no, it's not how it works in any form or fashion. We do know that racism is something that's taught. Also, I will also argue that uh, in part because we individuals on the spectrum are very uh, much uh, based on logic and function, that racism is illogical. It is not based in science. Uh, also, even if you look statistically speaking and you are a white person and you think, oh, well, you know, I'm afraid of a black person because they may attack you. Statistically speaking, uh, that is uh, extremely highly unlikely or the thought that they're going to engage in theft or drug usage or whatever. Again, statistically speaking, when you just look at that logic. So for an individual, uh, whether they're on the spectrum or not, to try to advance racist rhetoric and use uh, being neurodiverse as an excuse for it, it is simply an excuse and the individual has chosen to engage in racist antics. It has nothing to do with their neurotype. All right, so I will move to the third question. What's your advice for women who feel that having an unofficial diagnosis is more detrimental, having an official diagnosis is more detrimental than just being self-diagnosed or living with, without the official diagnosis? I'm gonna give an answer that's probably unpopular. They might be right. Yeah, I'm just gonna tell you. Because it's this, every circumstances are very different for probably everyone. So I have, you know, a formal diagnosis. Um, but sometimes I wonder if I knew several years ago what I know now, would I have have obtained this formal diagnosis? Which I, because there, this is a very a, a very ableist world that we live in. And so, um, although the formal diagnosis can, in some ways, be a way to, you know, possibly get support in terms of, um, the, you know, ADA um, at one's work or accommodations, it can, it, you know, it can provide a level of, of assistance for some people. It can be also validating, but it also can be a tool that can be used against you. Um, in circumstances um, for, of, you know, of custody, for example, um, there are approximately 35 states, um, of 35 states and territories of the, U in the United States are affiliated with it in which disability can be used as grounds for, um, you know, seeing you as a less favorable um, candidate for custody in a, in a divorce or in uh, an adoption or foster care or, or any type of other situation. In 10 states and territories, this is the case even in the complete absence of any neglect or abuse. So just because you and person X broke up, you are, might be a far more suitable person, but your disability can be counted against you. 
Um, there's a number of other situations and things that have been utilized where it's been, you know, there are unfortunately predators and, um, and people who seek out individuals. There's a, a lot of reasons. So while it is, you know, as, as Adrian mentioned, it is nothing to be ashamed of. It is nothing wrong. It is not deficient uh, in any way um, to do so, um, to have a diagnosis, to identify as autistic. For some people, it not only is it not safe, it's also very difficult. A lot of providers don't understand how to diagnose people who are who don't you know who don't seem to be a three year old a five year old little white boy or or kid or someone who doesn't seem to be expressing or presenting in the way that they they see it's, it's a very complicated matter. Absolutely, and it and it can be also very stressful. Um, and as someone noted in the next question here, official diagnosis being very expensive and asking, uh, is it free? Is there a free reliable self-diagnosis tool? Um, I, I've run across various kind of questionnaires online that I found to be somewhat helpful. Uh, and I'm happy to provide links to those uh, in the resources page. But I, I think what um, Dr. Marenike had pointed out that if you don't need it necessarily to get an accommodation, you might be better off without it. And to truly consider, because the thing is, there's a community out there for you, and they'll understand either way, and it doesn't make you any less uh, of an individual on the spectrum, especially given how, unfortunately, uh, sexist and racist that medicine and the gatekeepers of who is diagnosed autistic and is not can be. So, um, yes, again, things to bear in mind. Marina K, did you have something else you wanted to say about um, self-diagnosis? Yes, uh, I, I did quickly. Yes, I wanted to say self-diagnosis is absolutely valid. Um, I self-diagnosed prior to getting my um, diagnosis. I live in the um, you know, fourth largest city in America where there's you know, world-renowned medical centers. And yet, when it was time for me to be assessed, I had to be on the waiting list for months because of the fact there were so few people who would uh, you know, evaluate adults, whereas there were hundreds you know, to select for children, if not more. Um, but and so there is a researcher, I believe it's Amy, Dr. Amy Pearson, and the book, who has actually done a lot of follow-up on individuals who self-diagnosed and later obtained a diagnosis. And it's very it's frequent that people, this isn't something that you just think and just make up and say, this is me. You know, there's, there's diagnostic criteria and it's, it's you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a very complicated matter. And so I would um, encourage people, there is actually one of the things that AWN does is we, um, we do some things with education and research and there is a tool that um, actually our um, executive director, um, Sharon, is the um, lead investigator with, um, um, with several other universities and entities called the, um, so it's, a, a, it's the SAAT, so the um, self, um, I, oh my goodness, um, self, it might be self um, advocate, um, autistic traits. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying the acronym correctly, but it's going to be one of the first diagnostic tools that was created that's intentionally neurodiversity affirming with um, lead with autistic researchers in the lead in collaboration with non-autistic researchers. We've, uh, there are other autistic tools that exist, but they are typically created with a traditional research team and a couple of autistic people, you know, peripherally involved. So um, the SAAT. That will be um, available for um, you know for some of you. There's some um, there is some research about it already out, just kind of explaining the tool and the process of it. Um, Fantastic. And we will definitely provide you with resources and links to these resources in our resource sheet, which we will follow up with with a copy of this recording so you can access it. Um, I will definitely also add that if you do end up doing some research or look for things, uh, from my own experience uh, and diving in, uh, when I recognize that, oh, that's me, um, uh, which was about four or five years ago, I, um, I found that the most helpful research came out of the UK and in countries where they provide universal healthcare. Uh, and I would argue that that's in part because it's more diverse research um, and that it's covering more people when it comes to women and also people of color, uh, as opposed to here in the United States where uh, oftentimes individuals, again, as Dr. Marenike had mentioned, uh, they can be penalized 
for uh, having a diagnosis uh, and also where healthcare providers don't necessarily want to provide the diagnosis because it means they have to provide certain care. So uh, doctors will actually work against it uh, and your healthcare provider or uh, health insurance company may deny certain claims or push you even further. And I just, um, it's clear that capitalism can get in the way of actual knowledge when it comes to science and medicine. So I found the most riveting and um, the most inclusive research to be uh, from abroad. Uh, so I highly recommend keeping that in mind as you may find that it's very limited here in the States uh, when you look. Uh, I'll also bring up this last question. How would you approach a situation where upper management wants to lay you off or fire you after disclosing an autism diagnosis? And uh, the lawyer in me simply says, you need to lawyer up without a doubt. Lawyer That's up. what I was about to say. Call yeah. your lawyer. <laughs> yeah, you just, you straight lawyer up. Uh, you follow the rules. Um, I have been in a situation where we're not going to get to discuss it, but um, with workplace sexual harassment, no, you lawyer up. Exactly. You follow the rules and uh, individuals on the spectrum as um, often be, often tend to be pretty good at following rules uh, and you did what you were supposed to do. And so they're supposed to do what they're supposed to do, but holding them accountable, uh, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't uh, second guess that. Uh, you need to take care of you and you deserve to be in a work environment where you are not discriminated against. So uh, I really do encourage you to do that. And I also really encourage you all to continue to do your knowledge, your learning, your education when it comes to DEI. Thank you so much for joining us, Marina Kay, um, especially on this very important topic. And can you please tell our participants, our guests today, where they can find more information about the work that you do and the work that AWN does? Yes, thank you, everyone. So um, I, I noticed that Sophie put it in the chat, but I'll also share it if you allow. Um, AWN, we are on social media, so you know, pretty much all forms of social media. Um, our website is um, awnnetwork.org. Um, and so you can even Google that and you can find us there and we'd love to provide any information to any of you. Um, we, we, um, we realize that everyone is not autistic, we are a minority within the population, but neurodiversity is a fact of life for all of us. It's something that impacts all of us. And so um, you can gain some knowledge and support those in your life. And thank you so much for being here, everyone, and happy ADA anniversary. Thank you so much. I want to thank you all for joining us. We hope you join us next month for our conversation. Please stay tuned. You will get an email about it. And once again, I appreciate you joining us for realizing an untapped resource, making your workplace welcoming for autistic women. Take care.